On behalf of the Louisiana Center for the Book in the State Library of Louisiana, thank you for joining us for this virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival presentation. This program is the Louisiana Young Reader's Choice Award winner for grades 6 to 8, Game Changer, with Tommy Greenwald and Megan Thomas. Tommy Greenwald's Game Changer is on 15 state lists, was an Amazon Best Book of the Month, a Yalsa Top 10 pick, and a Junior Library Guild Premier Selection. Greenwald is also the author of the Crime Biters and Charlie Joe Jackson series, among many other children's books. He is the co-founder of Spotco Advertising and the lyricist and co-book writer with Andrew Lippa of John and Jeff, an off-Broadway musical. To read more, visit TommyGreenwald.com. Megan Thomas is the current youth consultant for the State Library of Louisiana, after serving as a school librarian and a programming supervisor, both in Calcasieu Parish. She was awarded the LLA 2019 Public Librarian of the Year Award for her work with Calcasieu Public Library. She has a bachelor's in history from LSU, a master's of library and information sciences from LSU, and a master's of World War II studies from Arizona State University. Thomas likes historical nonfiction, scuba diving, traveling, and the smell of old books. Ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Greenwald and Megan Thomas. Well, I'm here today with Tommy Greenwald, author of the Lyric uh, 2020 and 2021 6th to 8th Committee winner, Game Changer. We have several questions for you today, Mr. Greenwald. How are you? Great. And I'm uh, so honored to have uh, won this award from you guys. I've done a bunch of school visits in Louisiana. Um, I know you well. Um, I know your schools well. They're, it's such a great group down there. Maybe I did a little lobbying on behalf of the book when I was down there. It's entirely possible, which may have helped. But because uh, I was in Baton Rouge, I think in 2019, late 2019. Um, every little bit helps, but uh, it'd be great to be here. And, and thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming. Um, we do have several questions that students and just general audience members from Louisiana have submitted to us. Sure. Um, the first thing we got lots of feedback about the Charlie Joe Jackson series and how the character came to be and where did the name come from. Um, can you share a little bit of backstory about that with our festival virtual yes, festival goers? I sure can. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy of that book here with me to, to hold up, but I assume most people know that it started with a book called uh, Charlie Joe Jackson's Guide to Not Reading. And Char the, the name is, is an easy, simple, and funny story. It's my three sons' names kind of put together. I have a son, Charlie, a son, Joe, a son, a son Jack. I used to ask kids in school visits, what do you think my kids' names are? And they would all go, Charlie, Joe, and Jackson. And I said, close, <laughs> but Charlie, Joe, and Jack are my sons. So that's where the sons comes from. So uh, I grew up loving books and I married a great woman who also loves reading books. So of course we thought our kids would love books too. It didn't quite happen that way. I've talked to many people who work in the reading business, publishing people, uh, media specialists, teachers, educators, and I've met so many people, the more they love reading, the less their kids love reading. Mm -hmm. And it's an incredibly frustrating experience to try to convince kids who are determined not to read that they would really love it if they gave it a shot. And I wasn't writing books for kids or even thinking about writing books for kids at this point. This is maybe maybe a bit over 10 years ago. I'd written other kinds of things, but after exhausting myself looking for kids, for, for books that my kids would like, I decided to take a crack at writing one. And I wanted to write a book about a kid who has everything going for him and is sympathetic in every way and is funny he's funny he's a not nice kid he's a kind kid he loves his family just happens to be very allergic to books because there are a lot of books out there where kids don't like to read but they're they're often serious books and they're often main characters who have other issues they might have trouble in school or family issues and it's manifested with not wanting to learn not wanting to read and I, I had a different experience with my kids because they were all, you know, knock on wood, relatively happy, healthy, well-adjusted kids. And those kids don't like reading too. Um, <laughs> so it, was, it wasn't so much of an attempt to dive inside the soul of a non-reader. It was an attempt to show 
kids who don't like to read a that there are a lot of people like them b that they're just as good as other kids they're they non-readers are great kids just like readers it's not a value judgment of any kind and c it was a bit of reverse psychology if i could get a kid to pick up a book ostensibly about how to avoid books and find his way to actually enjoying that book he might pick up another book he might pick up another charlie joe book he might pick up another funny book and it's a sneak attack on kids who, who are determined to avoid books and and to help them discover that, that books and reading can be fun awesome well, that's something that really appeals to us on the lyric committee uh -huh. the louisiana reader's choice program is that we're always trying to really reach those reluctant readers or those readers yes. who just don't quite feel like they fit into the majority of niche audiences for books um yeah, yeah i've gotten a, a, a ton of response on those books not just from non-readers kids who love to read right. have, have, enjoy them just as much boys girls but it was hard on the heels of some famous reluctant reader books like the Wimpy Kids series. And it was right when people discovered that if you put the right book in a kid's hands, it doesn't have to be a, a long novel. It can be a graphic novel. It can be a, a funny book, a fun book. There's a way to get them in the habit of just holding a book in their hands and it, then anything can happen. Yeah, exactly. Um, so during the process of picking our nominated list that you won last year, um, our committees try to find titles that will appeal to that reluctant reader or not reluctant reader status, but we want it to appeal to a wide range of audience. Um, yeah. Game Changer was one of the ones that really ended up appealing to a major scale of our readers in Louisiana. Um, we loved the non-traditional format. That was all anybody could talk about. Um, what mm -hmm. made you decide to write the book that way? I mean. That was very unusual and it was it worked perfectly. Yeah, thanks for that. It's a good question. People have called it a novel in verse in some articles I've read and, and read uh, read in some reviews. And I certainly don't think of myself as any sort of poet or a writer of, of verse. But I did know from the very beginning that I wanted to have a stream of consciousness feel to it because the first aspect of the story that sunk into my head as something I wanted to write was about people talking to a child uh, who couldn't respond, to a main character even who couldn't respond. Because I feel like when people are talking to someone who ostensibly is non-responsive, they're almost talking to themselves and they're almost in a way more open, more honest, more intimate, and almost like they're in a confession where they will, would say things to somebody knowing that they are unable to respond that they would never say to them in a normal conversation. And that was the first aspect of the story that, that came to me. It's like, what would happen if the entire story could be told in a sequence of monologues basically to, to a child who is unable to respond or, or not really a child, a 14 year old kid in this case or 13 year old kid. And then I said, but there's gotta be more of the story. It can't, it can't just be that, that might get tired after a while and to, unravel the mystery you have to have this generation talking to themselves and trying to figure out what happened and how do they talk to themselves they talk to themselves sure in person in school and in class and and at lunch and you know when they're hanging around with each other after school but so much of today's communication between kids happens on devices happens through texts happens through social media happens through ways of them actually reading and writing to each other in a way that, that is, is brand new to this most recent generation. And I felt like the book wouldn't ring true if it didn't have that aspect of storytelling to it. It was a challenge for me because I text, I text all the time and I, and I do do some social media, but I, I'm pretending to be two 13 year olds texting each other and, and a bunch of 13 and 14 year olds communicating with each other on social media. And I'm not 13 or 14, just FYI. <laughs> so I had to make sure it felt real. And I, I showed excerpts to my kids and to some other much younger readers to make sure that it didn't feel like a, an old guy trying to sound like young kids. But for the story to ring true, I felt it really had to have a variety of different kinds of storytelling. And then as, as the storytelling developed and the, and the story itself developed, I figured a good way to kind of break up these kinds of narratives was that interview construct with the 
with the um, counselor and the student who are kind of getting to know each other in a different way. And that's one of the, one of the only in the book true dialogue moments between an adult and a child an adult and a, and a child that has a chance to grow throughout the book and it was in, in a way that was its own little rewarding mini story to tell from the beginning to the middle and the end because Ethan is so reluctant at the beginning to share anything in any way and eventually of course he does and that leads to the resolution of the book so that felt like a great little counterpoint to everything else that was happening yes um so that is a dark origin kind of that you got the idea from and yeah. really reflected in the topic in game changer mm -hmm. which is much more serious than your charlie joe jackson series um yeah. but what made you decide to tackle the subject of head injuries and hazing in school sports um it's a very good question i had written not just charlie joe but uh, several other series uh, a series called crime biters and then a project z series about a kid who happens to be a zombie so he's trying to figure out how to fit in as a zombie and that has a little bit more of action adventure to it but it's those are all basically comic series and and series that are not to be taken too seriously by the reader although hopefully they get some subtle messaging coming out of those books about how to be good people um but after maybe 15 or so books along those lines i felt i was eager to try a different kind of challenge a, a more serious kind of book and i'd always been fascinated I'm, I'm a big sports person and i'm a i'm a big uh spectator sport person i love to watch several sports i played sports as a kid soccer mostly and two out of my three boys were athletes throughout high school and i loved going to watch them play like most parents love watching their kids play and one of my kids my youngest jack was a football player and I loved watching him play too. I just, I just love the sport. I still love watching the NFL. Um, and it was interesting because as he was growing up and playing through middle school and then into high school, it, it, was, it was right when the media attention really started to focus on the dangers of the sport. And a lot of leading media outlets like the New York Times and 60 Minutes were, were doubling down and, and it seemed like for a while there a concussion story or a CTE story about retired players who were now facing the terrible after effects of a career playing football were really starting to come to light. And so it fascinated me, A, how a, a, a sport that is so incredibly popular would manage to maintain its popularity through the knowledge that there are these terrible repercussions that can happen. And also how youth football seems to be held to a different standard of acceptable behavior in terms of the adult kid dynamic than almost anything else. And the, and the clearest example I can give is when I would occasionally pick up Jack uh, after practice, but get there a little early and I'd watch a little bit of practice and I would hear how the kids are interacting with coaches and how the coaches are, are interacting with the kids and the, the, the language, the, the dialogue, the attitude, the, 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 the screaming and bellowing and, and verbal pyrotechnics. I don't want to use the word verbal abuse because it's a little too loaded, but I would sit there and watch this and go, this would not be tolerated in any other aspect of society. A, a teacher can't scream at a student this way. A, a piano teacher can't scream at a piano student this way. Um, you, you pick any other discipline where an where adult is mentoring a kid and it just doesn't happen the way it does on the football field. But not only is it expected, it's accepted and it's par for the course. And I was fascinated in that. And I was also fascinated in the fact that my own reaction was to it was, geez, well, okay. I hope he wins on Friday or Saturday. It's just like, it did didn't make me go, this is disgraceful. I'm pulling you off the field and that's it. Uh, he, he loved it. He loved his coaches. He loved his teammates. There's so many brilliantly great things about playing a high school sport and including football, the, the, the learning how to win and lose with grace and bonding with friends you make for life and having mentors in these coaches. But, you know, the, the positives are so dynamic that the negatives 
if they could be called negatives or or just you know the givens of, of how this sport is run um kind of take a back seat and they took a back seat to me and they took a back seat to my son so i was like well this is all worth exploring both the danger of it and the culture of it and so that's how i kind of came up with the idea for a story that i wanted people to assume was about concussions and the dangers of football but when they read it, they realized it was about much more than that. It was about the culture of the game on the field and off and what we can maybe do to look at it, examine it and address it. Well, um, I'm surprised it did as well as it did down here because we're a big football state in Louisiana. Yes, I know. Everybody really embraced the book. But don't you think that the book itself, I mean, I, I hope it doesn't come off as an anti-football. No, not in any at all. Way. I, want to, I wanted to make it, very clear that that I personally think there are things about football that are a incredibly enjoyable just to watch and be incredibly important for kids to participate in so I tried to be balanced about the approach it came off very well um but have you received any negative feedback or backlash for it because that was a very controversial topic and still really is I have not really no I I've had a lot of people asking for a sequel <laughs> Because I, if I had any complaint from readers, and um, I've gotten really wonderful feedback, basically, but um, some readers have been frustrated that you don't really know, you know, you don't, you want to know what's going to happen next. And a lot of people wrote to me and said, "Is Teddy going to play again? And is he going to be on the team next year? And all this kind of stuff." And I would always kind of answer similarly, which was, "I feel like." If I had to guess, and I and I, you never know, but this kind of injury, I think, would not allow Teddy to go back onto the football field. Hopefully, he would find another sport that was less physical, um, since he's such a great athlete and he's so competitive. He would probably participate in the football program in some other way. Um, and then I would say, I feel like this this story, even though Teddy's journey might be just beginning, this particular story has has ended. Um, but I have written two more books. I wrote a book called Rivals that came out earlier this year, and that also takes place in the same town, Walthorn, and it has a couple of the same characters. Um, and that's about basketball. And that's, that's, I have that book right here. That's what that looks like. And I'm just finishing a book called Dinged. Um, Dinged is the term that it's kind of a euphemism for football players getting knocked in the head a little bit. And that is all, that's the third book that takes place in Walthorn. It's about a kid who's a great football player, a great quarterback. And his dad was an NFL star. And as this young freshman phenom comes into his own as a superstar player, his dad starts to show signs of brain, kind of delayed brain trauma oh, himself wow. as, a, as a player, um, you know, when he's, that he suffered as a player. And so... It, it becomes an issue whether or not the kid is going to continue to pursue what appears to be a golden career in football, knowing what could happen and, and knowing that his father's an example of what could happen. And that's so those are three books that I feel like, even though they're not sequels, those two books aren't sequels to Game Changer, they're all in the same kind of family of novels that are about youth sports, but are about the youth culture in general that I hope appeal equally to sports fans and non-sports fans because they're about conflicts and issues that, that all of us face. We technically, when we saw it on the list, we were like, oh, look, a boy's book. And then once yeah. the majority of the committee really started reading it, we were like, oh, this is so much more than a boy's book. This is, yeah. I mean, the sentiments that were expressed, the morals and lessons were very wide, appealed to a wide audience, so. Well, I, I'm grateful that you say that. Thanks. I, I, I always know that sports books or boys books can can check a box. And I'm kind of grateful that that might get them in the door in, in somebody's house or at a library or on a list. But my goal is always to have very full characters, both male and female, and have a full story that is not just for sports fans. I try to make them as universal as possible, even though I, I, I fully realize and I think the marketing team appreciates that they know who the first low-hanging fruit readers are. <laughs> We're always trying to get good boys books, so we appreciate it. <laughs> Excellent.
Um, so our lyric committee consists of public librarians, school librarians, and educators. And we chose Game Changer and 11 other titles out of literally hundreds of books to be on our nominated list. Yeah. Um, Louisiana's sixth, seventh, and eighth graders voted for their favorite. Game Changer was a resounding winner. Wow. And can you just tell us, um, the book festival people, the kids who voted, who are watching this, what that award does mean to you? It's 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 hard to describe because from my first days as a writer, the most meaningful things that would happen always centered around readers. They always centered around an email I might get from a kid who said, I didn't like to read and then I read your book and it was really funny and I might read another book. And so, and they're the hard, kids are the hardest audience, they're the toughest audience, they're the most honest audience, they'll let you know how they feel no holds barred, no self-censoring going on. So the fact that um, it managed to run both gauntlets, both amongst the educators who picked the, the core list um, and, and found value in it, and then to have that kind of validated by the kids themselves voting for the winner is, is kind of amazing. I, I am so bummed that we can't kind of do this in person and I can't be there to thank everybody personally. I get it, of course, you know, this is, it, it is, it is what it is and we're living in the time we are living in. Um, but I do, I truly hope to come down there again for, for school visits when the dust uh, clears and everything settles and um, to, to just thank as many kids and educators as I can in person because it means it means a whole lot it's just it makes the whole thing worthwhile it really does well I guess we're gonna have to check out rivals and see if we can get you down here for next year too <laughs> absolutely I think rivals will appeal to a lot of the same things in kids and adults because it, it's I don't know if you know anything about it but it, it it's about two rival middle school basketball players who are both great but are both feeling pressure outside um to be more than great to kind of in one case lift up the family in another case to fulfill his father's legacy and 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 there's so much competition in youth sports now that the idea that it's supposed to be fun and supposed to just be a way to exercise and a way to make friends and bond for life, to, to learn about the spirit of competition and good sportsmanship, sometimes does get lost in the amount of intensity and pressure that goes into youth sports. Um, and I say that not as a scold, but as someone who participated in it. When I was a parent watching my kids play, looking back on it, I, I can't believe how invested I was in whether they would win or lose. It's kind of embarrassing. And I think most adults whose kids have aged out of sports, when they look back, kind of feel the same way. They're like, holy smokes, that really didn't mean all that much in the greater scheme of things. But at the time, you're, 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 you're nervous watching your kids play. And if they win, you have a good weekend. If they don't win, you have a bad weekend, all this crazy stuff. And it's, it's something that I think is a fascinating topic, both because it's, it's, it's not fair to the kids themselves how much pressure we put on them. And so it's kind of fascinating to watch how they deal with it and, and, and rivals, they deal with it in interesting and different ways. But also society at large just kind of has to remember and take a look at the fact that these things are going on. And there's been a lot written about it kind of from a journalistic perspective and an analytics perspective, but turning it into drama in these books I think is something kind of new and I'm, I'm very grateful to be doing it. So Rivals did come out last year. Take a look at it. If you need me to send you a copy, let me know and hopefully you'll like it. I will never say no to books from you. So <laughs> okay, good. Good. All right, just to wrap things up, Mr. Greenwald, yeah. we have some rapid fire questions straight from Louisiana students. Excellent. Are you ready with some rapid fire answers? Yeah, rapid fire meaning you want me to like give you five word answers or something these are all one word these are very oh, one word fun okay. yes. like a this or that kind of thing kind of yes <laughs> okay go okay favorite color well i used to say blue but to be honest purple 
Per- yes, go Tigers. We're yeah, let's yeah. shoot people down here. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> By the way, I just saw that your coach, uh, you know, the LSU coach is stepping down at the end of the year. Oh, yeah, that's a whole conversation for off recording. <laughs> I, I bet. I bet. The, the legend, that guy. Anyway, go ahead. Favorite food? Oh, my God. Anything in the chocolate family, but probably chocolate ice cream. Ooh, perfect. Yeah. Favorite beverage? Coke. Coke? It's, it's a, it's a, it's a vice. <laughs> it's a vice. I can't, I can't help it. Product placement right there. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Your favorite board game? Um, I certainly loved Monopoly growing up, but I'm going to be a little different and go with Stratego, which I used to play all the time. I don't even know if it's still out, but it was a game I loved when I was a kid. Have you heard of it? No. My runner up that I'm sure people still play and I've heard of it is Battleship. Oh, I, used yeah. play, I used to play Battleship all the time too. I play that online now. It's very fun. <laughs> yes, I've heard people are playing it online now. Um, favorite superhero? Um, I have to go with Batman because I loved the 1960s Batman and Robin series, Batman, which was, which was. That's Adam, Adam West? West? Yeah, it was Adam West and Burt Ward and it was incredibly cleverly written and as funny as it was action oriented and it's, it's absolutely hilarious and i remember watching it as a kid and then i remember watching it in my 20s and going holy smokes this is as much for me now as it was for me then so i've always had a soft spot for batman since then have you seen the trailer for the new movie i have yeah, Look yeah. Forward, looking forward to it absolutely there were a couple batman movies that i was like that was like a step too far for me like the Chris Nolan movies, I know everybody loved, but I, I remember watching one of them. I can't remember which one going like, what's going on? Like the plots were complicated and convoluted. I'm like Adam West, where are you when I need you? Those were very easy to follow. <laughs> 25 minutes, episodes in and out. It was easy. Perfect. Mornings or nights? Ooh, well, well growing up, nights all the way because I was a terrible um I was terrible at early rising, but when you have kids and you have dogs, everything changes. And now <laughs> I get up, I try to get my exercise out of the way. In my heart, I'm a night owl though, so night owl. That'll work. Yeah. Three things that you have to have for a productive writing day. Um, that's a good one. Um, a laptop, that's probably boring. Um, a play session with my dogs, just to like, get in a relaxing state of mind and a place to go because something interesting for me is that I don't I never write at home I started out writing because I have a have a day job which I still have part-time where I go from Connecticut to New York on the train and I would be writing on the train and I got into the habit of writing in a busy situation in a noisy situation and so ever since then I've left the house to write um, the wow. pandemic, the pandemic made that tricky, and I figured out a way to, to write at home, of course, because I had to. But I much prefer being in a coffee shop or a library or even on a train, because I've always associated home with relaxing. It's like yeah. that's where you watch TV and that's where you play with the dogs and chill out. Because because writing, it started as a as an incredibly fun thing to do just because I like to do it and then it did become like another type of job and you have deadlines and responsibilities and you for me it was like I'm going to go to work I'm going to go to go to Barnes and Noble or go to the library and write a thousand words um, so it's a quirky habit but I but I like to get in the car and go so I can write wow that was not rapid fire I'm sorry about that hey but hey we'll take I have to explain it a little bit <laughs> um what are you currently reading? Oh, that's a good question. What am I currently reading? I'm currently reading a book called The Plot, which is an adult novel about a writing teacher who has a student with this incredible story. And the writing teacher is jealous of the, of the student because he has this great story. And then, and I'm early in the book, so I haven't quite figured out how, but then, but then the student who's like in his thirties, um, a couple years later, he finds out that he has he has passed away unexpectedly, and so he kind of steals he steals the student's plot and becomes an incredibly famous author through the stolen plot until he starts getting letters saying, "I know what you've done," and someone starts yeah. So it's kind of a book about writing and publishing and who owns what story and 
and what is what, can you own a story and so from a writer's perspective when i read a review of it i was like this sounds intriguing so i've i've, I've just dived into it but it sounds interesting the plot i need to write that down <laughs> yeah write that down if you're if you have time in your life to read the occasional adult novel check it out only a little only a little <laughs> and then my personal question yes who is your all-time favorite author could be kids author ya journal journalist anything that is it's it's that's that's a really tough one to say <laughs> um there's a i'll give you two authors one is my favorite author as a child who was Matt Christopher who wrote sports books um, and he was the guy that that was the guy I hope I am for the occasional reader because he was the one that opened the world of books for me and I know the Matt Christopher books are still on the shelves in the libraries I think he he, he might have um, people writing books kind of under his brand name now but um, his sports stories I thought were just short little gems of conflict and drama and resolution and then there's an author named herman woke who herman woke w-o-u-k who writes brilliantly descriptive and detailed historical novels um and i've always been a history guy and so he kind of has written books that sit in my sweet spot and I know if I'm diving into a Herman Walk book, I'll be swept away and, and taken into other worlds, which is kind of one of the great things about reading books. Okay, well, that sounds wonderful. Everybody write that down. Write that down, everybody. <laughs> okay, Mr. Greenwald, well, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Megan. Uh, but I appreciate you participating. Of course, and um, send me an email and I'll send you a copy of Rivals and, um, Maybe we'll rendezvous again in the not too distant future. Sounds perfect. I appreciate it. Okay. Say hi to everybody down there. Hi, everybody in Louisiana. I'm sorry <laughs> to be there to give you all hugs, but virtual hugs from me up here in, in Connecticut and New York. I, I, I wish I could be there. I miss you and, and, and maybe we'll see you soon. Sounds good. And can, again, congratulations. And thank you for giving us such a great book. Thank you so much for this great honor. I really appreciate it. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you for watching this presentation of the virtual 2021 Louisiana Book Festival. Please visit our official bookseller, Cavalier House Books, and receive 20% off all featured festival titles through the end of the year. A special thank you to our festival sponsors. The Louisiana Book Festival will return on October 29th, 2022.